Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself for two decades now. I'm also the co-founder, executive vice president, and chief medical officer in the nonprofit CLL Society. Con, you want to introduce yourself, please? Yes, I'm Professor Con Tam from Melbourne, Australia. So I'm a, a CLL specialist. I'm the head of the lymphoma service at my hospital, the Alfred Hospital, and a professor of medicine at uh, Monash University. Thanks for um, asking me to come on today, Brian. And thanks. We're talking on actually different days in California, and uh, but that's the <laughs> blessings of Zoom. You're in Australia, I'm in California. Uh, but one of the things we have in common is we've seen a revolution in how CLL is taken care of these days. In these new targeted therapies, specifically the BTK inhibitors, butin tyrosine kinase inhibitors, have changed everything. And you presented some very interesting data on the group that still remains very difficult to treat, those with 17P deletion and one of the newer BTK inhibitors, Xanabrutinib. And this was one arm of a larger trial, the Sequoia trial. So can you set this up for our patients to understand why this trial was so important and this particular arm of this trial is so important? Absolutely. So um, as you uh, mentioned, so 17P deletion is a a uh, very poor risk factor for CLL. Um, in fact, I still remember when I started training in Houston uh, under Professor Michael Keating uh, some 15, 20 years ago that if you have 17P deletion and you have CLL, you have a lifespan of less than two to three years maximum. So uh, it means that you do not respond to standard chemotherapy and in fact, there are no good treatment for it. And the Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors really changed the history of that. So uh, people with 17P deletion uh, responded to the BTK inhibitors, whereas other drugs have not worked in the past. And we have some clues that this class of drug is pretty effective from smaller studies of both ibrutinib and acalabrutinib, where, which are all Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, where a small number of patients were enrolled in, in, in studies. Um, and it suggested that it might work pretty well. But we don't have the confidence of big numbers. Now, xanabrutinib is a second generation BDK inhibitor. It has advantages over ibrutinib in that it has reduced side effects. And in a head to head study, it was actually more effective um, than ibrutinib in CLL. Um, and in this particular trial, it's a, what we call a frontline study. So patients who have had CLL who have never had chemotherapy or any other treatment in the past were enrolled to a frontline study of xanabrutinib. And amongst that group are a large group of patients with 17P deletion. So whereas previous studies with other drugs have had maybe like you know, 10, 20, or 30 patients, in this study, we actually have 111 patients with 17P deletion, which actually is the biggest group of patients ever treated for 17P deletion with any therapy. Um, so it gives us a confidence of numbers. And now that we've got more than five years of follow-up, it also gives us the confidence of how, how lasting the response is, so the long-term follow-up. And the basic message is that it confirms that the BDK inhibitors are some of the best drugs available in this uh, population. Uh, the response rate were extremely high, as you would expect. But more gratifyingly, you know, some five, six years down the track, the about three quarters of patients are still in remission. So about one quarter of patients have relapsed, but three quarters are still in remission, which is a remarkable result, given that if you remember I said before that the total lifespan of a patient in 17P deletion CLL in the past is about two to three years. And now we've got a drug where five years down the track, three in four patients are actually still in remission. And, and when they do relapse, they still have other drug options and other treatment after that. And really, I think it just shows what revolution that we've had in this very difficult to treat subgroup and really reinforces the message that if you have 17P deletion and you get started on xanabrutinib, that you can be very assured that you're on one of the best treatment possible. And this, it this is what we call progression-free survival. These patients have gone a long time 
And even if they relapse, that doesn't mean that they need treatment immediately. They could even go longer and they do have other options. This is really exciting that the other question patients always have is a safety. And sometimes we don't find out about problems till people have been on the drugs for several years. Um, yes. So five years is a good amount of time. Did any new problems jump up? And also this trial happened during COVID and I know infections were a significant concern in this trial. Correct. So, um, I mean, we already know that Xanabrutin is a very safe drug because we've had um, basically 11 years of experience with the drug now um, in various settings. And we've also had head-to-head -head randomized studies, two of them against Ibrutinib, uh, that show that the drug is safer. And with long-term follow-up of those studies, uh, we haven't had any unusual uh, 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 toxicity, uh, unusual side effects or unusual concerning uh, signals that, that you know there are long-term side effects, and the same applies to this uh, this cohort. So with more than five years of follow-up, we haven't seen any unusual side effects. You get the usual side effects that you get for Bruton's tyrosine uh, kinase inhibitors, which is an increased risk of bruising and bleeding. Um, the occasional patient gets atrial fibrillation, but that's something that you get with any of these drugs and of all the BDK available out there. Xanabrutinib is one of the ones which have a lower risk of uh, atrial fibrillation, and we didn't see anything else. So there was no other concerning signals. What about hypertension? Was that a risk? Mm. Uh, I, I just think hypertension is a risk for all BDK inhibitors. So we saw that most clearly with ibrutinib, where if you com compare it with the second generation, that ibrutinib is consistently the worst drug in terms of hypertension. Um, probably the best data for hypertension uh, it stems from acalabrutinib, which probably has the lowest risk of hypertension. And xanabrutinib, there are two studies that compare xanu versus ibrutinib, one of which showed a reduction in the rate of hypertension and the other, the other one did not. So I will rank uh, hypertension as being a problem for all three drugs, but most problematic for ibrutinib by far, and then xanabrutinib, and then perhaps acalabrutinib has a slight advantage. Uh, but it doesn't matter which drug you're on. You know, you knew you need to be blood pressure monitored and treated by your doctor because we do know that patients on all three classes of drugs get uh, high blood pressure, and if you don't get that treated, that is a risk factor for heart arrhythmias. And I'm going to say even more: these drugs have become so good. It's the were survivorship issues, and cardiac is a big part of that, and taking care of your heart because it's becoming less and less likely we're going to die of our CLL and more likely we're going to die of things that other people die of in their 70s and 80s, heart disease, second cancers and infections. Let me touch on infections a little bit because this happened in yep. COVID. And when I looked at the paper, there was a significant incidence of COVID uh, uh, during this. Uh, can you comment on that and how the BTK inhibitors in general and, and Xanabrutinib uh, affected the infection risk and COVID in particular? Yeah. So uh, we uh, obviously, you know, a lot of these studies were done during COVID. So patients caught COVID um, and um, we had to adjust our reporting of these studies to account for the fact that there were occasional patients uh, who died from COVID. Um, and therefore, when we look at the, the survival curve, we present data with and without, you know, those COVID deaths. As a big picture, um, patients on Bruton's coronary kinase inhibitors don't typically die or have more severe COVID than, than other patients, okay? Um, so uh, we do know, in fact, th there was some experimental data to suggest that these drugs may actually be good for stopping the severe form of COVID where it sort of starts to infiltrate into the lung and damage the lungs. So uh, we haven't really seen a signal that any of the drugs, the BDK inhibitors are particularly bad in patients with CLL with COVID. Um, but we do know that certain other drugs like rituximab and obinutuzumab and anti-CD20s are very high risk for patients with CLL who catch COVID. Undoubtedly, those drugs increase the severity of COVID. Uh, but so really, you know, we presented data in order to, to give a clean picture um, uh, of, you know, the impact of COVID on this study and what would have happened had COVID not been around. Um, and yes, we acknowledge that COVID is a important uh, infection signal for any patient with CLL, but we don't actually think that xanabrutinib or indeed any of the BTK inhibitors are 
particularly bad for patients if they catch COVID. Overall, I think this is incredibly encouraging. You're talking three quarters of the patients still on the drug, still uh, not having relapsed, five years out, no new adverse events, uh, patients doing well. Um, this is a remarkable turnaround um, in what just from a decade ago. Any final thoughts or any message you would want to get across to a patient who's yep. diagnosed with CLL and who has what's been traditionally a really bad marker, but maybe that tradition needs to be re rethought, rechallenged. Yeah, I, I think the, the message for all the patients out there is that we're doing so well with our new drugs and our new developments that uh, CLL is a disease that often people will now, even if it gets to a stage um, where it requires treatment, is often a disease that people would die of, die with rather than die off. So, you know, we, our treatment has become so good that as you pointed out, Brian, is a lot of it is about long-term survivorship issues now. So managing the other health issues um, around um, around the treatment and around the disease. And the only last word I would encourage is that we wouldn't be here had not been the brave 111 patients who joined our clinical trial you know, seven, six, seven years ago who said, yes, I will try this. I will do this for the good of mankind and medicine to advance uh, the cause for all. So. If you offer the clinical trial, please consider it because this is the way we advance medicine. And thank you for your bravery. And I would emphasize that. I mean, those people, because we didn't know how good a drug Xanabrutinib was six or seven years ago. Now we do. And I'm the product. I'm on my third clinical trial now, and I, I would not be alive today. I'm one of those people who beat the odds with 17P deletion two decades into my CLL. And why did I do that? Because I jumped on phase one trials. I was one of the first people in the world to take a BTK inhibitor. So these drugs really work and clinical trials are your access to the best and newest therapies. Uh, Dr. Tam, always great to talk with you. I always learn something. Thanks so much for what you're doing for the CLL community. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brian.